Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to today's upload. I hope everyone is doing well. Today I have got some just absolutely terrifying and amazing encounters to share with you. Before we jump into them, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, Simply subscribe, it doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Hey Jeff, I've had multiple encounters. I have a dog, a Borble. He's not the 200 pound version. He's the United States version. He's mixed with a boxer so they could control his size. But let me get on with the story. He ran away for two days into the woods. And I'm in Missouri between the county and city. But mixed urban area south off of 270 along a river front me and my brother looked for him when he first took off. We were armed, me with my P320, him with his CZ Scorpion Evo. I was walking along a field by the fence by the woods and we both heard a deep guttural growl. I felt the growl in my bones, like down to the core, like my skin and muscles shuddered as it happened. It lasted three to five seconds, but felt like a minute or two. I know it could have been because we were still moving, but it only took four or five steps. Then the trees to our left started to move as it ran diagonally the way we were going. And I wanted to turn back, but my brother didn't hear of the dog man or skinwalker, so he didn't believe it and ignored the trees and footsteps we had heard. It was excitement for him, and we both only had nine millimeters. I had 9 plus 19 in my P320, and his CZ was 9 by 19 and 9 by 21 cap capability. I use a V-Cron 365 SIG ammo, and he had been running a 9 by 21 plus P FMJ. It has a weird long 9mm that was 147 grain. I flashed my light to the left to keep an eye out, but... He said something just passed in front of us, and I flashed my light. I have an old light on my gun. He has some cheap piece of crap from a gum show. I pulled out my extra light out of my pocket. It's just an M&P TAC flashlight from Cabela's. He grabbed it and turned it on. The throw was way better than what he was using, so we continued down the field. I never stopped looking around keeping aware of my surroundings. We got toward the bottom off the field and the fence continued, but curves left, so we followed it. I found my dog here before when he ran away the first time months prior. He was hiding under a brush and came running when I called. Like, come on, let's get out of here. But back to current times, we walked past. I'm watching 11 o'clock to seven we crossed at 12 to 6, he had 1 through 5, and I saw up in the trees this hulking mass, a black, blacker than black beast. The best description is darker than the surroundings, and it was 9 o'clock, about 20 feet up in the tree, and there is a branch that extends towards us that it was reaching out. 
I got my brother's attention in an instant, and I said nine o'clock. He swung left so fast I didn't see him move. We both had lights on this thing in a split second. We fired. I shot six or seven shots. He shot between five to eight. We saw it get hit multiple times around its left side of the neck and chest area and a couple in the bicep area. It made an arg noise and grabbed its left side of its body with its arm that was around the tree and fell and ran off in the direction. We were at nine. It ran at 11 or 12 deeper into the woods. We immediately footed back home and like 10 minutes cleared our guns reloaded. I was so shell-shocked I couldn't believe what had happened, but ever since then, after my dog came back, I take him out at night between 1 in the morning and 3. I've seen something watching him and me with orangish, red glowing eyes. One time, it was a second pair of eyes lower, while the other one was on him. I noticed them real low moving towards us. I called my dog's name Loki. The thing looked at me and I reached in my jacket for my pistol. It jet off faster than anything I've ever seen before and jumped the gate. And I heard it clip the gate on the way over. Ever since then, I've told my fiance to not take him out at night. I'll do it. And why? And she laughed and shrugged it off. I bought a 300 blackout AR-15 and I use 125 grain frontier ammo. Great ammo for hogs and stuff with body fat, so I think it'd do damage, but she took the dog out at one in the morning to go to the bathroom, and I didn't know. She called me on my phone yelling, saying, come out, bring a gun, hurry. So I grabbed a baseball, my basketball shorts off the recliner in our room, grabbed a robe out of the closet, grabbed my SIG and the AR threw the air sling over my back as I ran to her, handed her the SIG, and said, what's going on? She told me and pointed to where I saw the orange eyes before and said something was crouched because I saw glowing eyes low to the ground by the gate. They grew in height taller than the gate. I said, babe, you just had your first dogman encounter. I called the dog and we went in. Now she won't walk the dog, period. But I've seen and dealt with it, bluff charging at me multiple times when I walk him and taking the trash out. Today's second Missouri subscriber encounter. Hey Jeff, I've sent you a few emails in the past about other subjects, but haven't yet told you of my experience. In the spring of 1981, my husband and I went on an overnight float trip on a Monday in Bourbon, Missouri, on the upper Merrimack River. We put out on the river by Joe from Joe's Canoe Rentals. He was to meet us at around 3 p.m. the next morning at our pickup point. We camped for the night at the mouth of his cave that was up a wooded hill. Many people use the cave for camping, as advised. In front of the actual cave entrance was a large stone overhang and stone walls, a large area where people could camp and be out of the rain. So we went to sleep at around one in the morning. I was awoken by the sound of a large man breathing, and it was coming from inside of the cave. I woke my husband, and he heard it as well. We then heard grunting sounds and sounds of the creature moving around, as if getting comfortable. We could hear its fur rub on the side of the wall. Each time it moved like this, a group of bats would fly out. My husband remembers aggressive stounds and stomping, where he says the ground under him would shake as if stomped. I don't remember that part, but I was distracted by trying to get my legs to stop shaking, as they were shaking badly and making noise inside of my sleeping bag. And I was afraid the noise would draw the creature out. At the time, we assumed it to be a bear. My husband told me there was a cliff on the outside wall, but he didn't think it could climb up to it. I climbed it. I'm not athletic, and it was a real rock wall climb. Having to find finger and toe holds, it was up about 10 feet and over 5 feet to get to the cliff. We climbed on to it, our feet overhanging the tree on the hill until daylight. 
I then stayed on that cliff and watched the opening of the cave as my husband packed our stuff up and we left. The rest of the float trip that day was horrible as the river was narrow and there were tall reeds on each side. And I was afraid something was going to come out of those reeds and grab us. We finally met up with Joe and he asked if there were any bears and we asked him if there were any bears in Missouri. The Department of Conservation said that at the time there were no bears in Missouri. Joe said, yeah. And we said, well, we had one in a cave last night. What he said next was strange. He said, oh, they're just little honey bears, not much bigger than a good sized dog, he said. Kansas didn't have any turkey and we didn't have any bear. So we gave them some turkey and they gave us some bear. I now wonder if he just said that all because he knew something was out there and didn't want word to get out that may affect his business. There weren't supposed to be any bears in Missouri at that time, but we all know how that goes. Most likely there was, but I mostly wonder about my husband hearing aggressive sounds and the stomping that shook the ground underneath him. Would a bear be big enough to do that? It doesn't seem likely to me. So, we don't know what we heard in that cave that night. What do you think? Today's third Missouri encounter is from a uh, friend of the channel. Good friend of, well, friend of mine. Good friend of mine. You're all good friends of mine. I, I've never met a lot of you. I've never met any of you in person. But I feel like we're all good friends when I talk to you. Uh, this fella now lives out of country. Um, but a super nice guy, I had him on the show, and um, just just a real genuine guy. And this, this encounter actually happened on the Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. So, Good day, Jeff. I hope you're doing well. This sighting happened when I was in the Air Force back in the early mid-90s in the Midwest. Please keep my name confidential, as I still do contract work for the military. One night I was doing a security exercise and outside of a restricted area that was wooded, sitting in an unarmed Humvee with three others all fully armed, we noticed a pair of red eyes watching us from about eight feet off the ground, looking over at them with a starlight device. We could see the outline of something standing there. We all had this feeling that we should not be seeing this and also that it was hostile. I put the Humvee in gear and we raced around to alert a fire team bunker where we went in and stayed for the rest of the night. Now, next email, this happened at Whiteman Air Force Base. It was a massive bipedal creature with shaggy hair. This happened in late October, early November as Halloween had just passed. I saw other things while I was there. Part of the base was built in an old Indian burial ground, but that was mainly spirits. Another email, Jeff, I've spoken with one of the other guys on the fire team as to what we saw that night. He came out of the driver's seat rear door and was about 10 to 15 feet away as we were all spaced out for tactical reasons. When we saw the first red-eyed bipedal creature watching us, he began scanning around as we scrambled back to the Humvee. He stated that he saw two more that were coming up from behind us at our 7 o'clock position. One was on all fours and stood about four feet tall. The second one was advancing bipedally at around seven and a half feet tall. It reminds me of the encounter in New England with the ambulance where one is being a decoy to keep the attention of the others and creep up behind. Thank you so much for sharing my encounter. Today's fourth Missouri subscriber submission. Greetings, Jeff. I hope this email finds you well. I just ran across your YouTube channel recently. For a couple of years, I've been listening to other channels. I live 12 miles east of an average town in southwest Missouri in the Stark City area. Four years ago, on my way to work at 3 a.m., I passed my neighbor's barn lot and upon approaching the culvert leading into the barn, 
There sat a black and gray animal sitting on its behind like a dog does with its back to me. As I approached closer, it turned its head to look at my car approaching. Dang, the eyes on that thing shone like a headlight on a car took me by surprise. Sitting down as it was, its head would have been about my shoulder height or approximately five feet. This also took me by surprise. The real shock was when it reared up and cleared the road and fence on the opposite side of the road where it was sitting right in front of my car. As I was 40 feet from passing where it had been sitting, the dog-like head and four to five inch hair on its back, not on its legs or underside, also a shock. It moved so fast in the air across the road and fence I was startled. That evening, on my way home, I stopped by my neighbor to tell him what I saw in the drive to his barn lot to let him know that it could be dangerous and to keep an eye out. That's when he began to tell me that he had been missing three young calves less than a month but old, and the mamas were restless looking for them. The following week, on the same routine, heading to work at three in the morning, I passed my neighbor's barn and house by a hundred yards or so, and right in front of me as the same creature bolted from the field on my left and over the fence hit the road one time and cleared the opposite fence, heading north to an open pasture. I stopped the car and turned it sideways in the road to see if I could see where it headed, and all I saw was the rear of the animal clear the north fence about 200 yards away. Now, that's fast moving because it didn't take me but a few seconds to turn my car to the north on this wide country road. Now, previous to this, I raised a rare breed of sheep and had about 70 at the time in 2014 to 2017. I would lose a sheep now and then. I lost a ewe and never found even a tuff of wool from her. But strangely, over time, at random, I would find adult sheep dead with a bite on their neck about six inches across. They would not be eaten, but all the wool on the side facing up would be scraped off with big, distinguishable, large claw marks on the skin, but not broken. These sheep have a large amount of lanolin from their skin, about two inches into the wool. And it's very bitter to the taste, so I guess whatever was doing it got the taste and lost the appetite. The wool would be scattered on the ground where the killing took place. These seven deaths were random during that three-year period, and that same within 22 young lamb only. They would go missing with no trace and never found. We have coyote, but Missouri Conservation and Preservation Department said these kills were not typical of coyote by the way the carcass was left in claw marks and bite on the neck too wide of a jaw pattern. They gave no other explanation as to what it could have been, but acted in a way that caused me to wonder what they weren't telling me. In May of 2018, while at the barn around dusk, the coyotes started howling about an eighth of a mile away in the brush and the timber. Then a very low but very loud roaring howl, scream, yell type noise came from between me and the coyotes, just about 150 yards down in the brush from the barn. That sound actually vibrated against my body as if it were a blast or energy wave hitting me. I've only seen one animal that was black that I couldn't identify back in 2018. It was on the south fence line of the hundred acres just south of the house, about a quarter of a mile away. It was on all fours and was the size of a half-grown Angus calf and that's what I thought it was until I was looking in the pasture west of the house and across the ridge of the hill bordering the timber, and I see this thing walking into the woods. It had to cross two fences and a road to get to where I saw it go into the woods. I'm not confessing anything that I don't have fact on, but I've wondered about the dogman issue, because I know they are in Oklahoma, just 27 miles west of me. And I know they are a nomad type of animal. 
Also, I want to add I live just a few miles east of Fort Crowder Military Base. Thanks for what you do, Jeff. Prayers for your health. Today's fifth Dogman subscriber encounter. Now, I've had this uh, female subscriber on, and you all will remember it if you've been here for a while because, um, well, her ex-husband's a coward. And if you heard this, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, Jeff, this happened mid-summer in Versailles, Missouri, approximately 2009. I was outside with my then husband while he was smoking. It was about 11.30 and it seemed like any other night. The next thing I know he yells, big black dog, and pushes me down the stairs. I looked to my right through my backyard that had a detached three-car garage with a sidewalk that led to it. And all I see is this huge black shadow type thing that sounded like a horse with claws. My then husband had already locked himself inside, leaving me out there alone. The huge shadow figure that sounded like a horse with claws was coming up on me fast, but I literally had nowhere to go. It blew past me so fast that I fell back to the ground on my butt. I stood up as quick as I could and ran back to the end of the driveway, looked both ways down the street and saw nothing. I was terrified at the time and never heard of the dog man. I can still hear the sounds of those claws on the sidewalk moving towards me. Whatever it was, it didn't growl, snarl, or make any other sound. What I describe as a horse with claws, and it was fast. I now know what a dog man is, and I am certain that's what I faced that night. Through having her on, she also shared that the same cowardly little man, um, they moved. Uh, and he, I guess he was just a big jerk. And um, so he's outside smoking a cigarette again and just picks up a, a, a rock and lobs it into the woods. And she kind of looks at him and, you know, just said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And uh, the rock is lobbed back at him, almost hitting him. Um <laughs> And then he ran back inside the house on that one as well and locked her out. And now she's with someone new that will not lock her outside when there are big cryptids around. Today's sixth Missouri Dogman subscriber encounter. Hey Jeff, I hope you are doing well. Here's my first encounter. I hope you enjoy it. Sorry, it's a rough draft. It was the summer of 93 and my family and I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, next to where the propane tanks fell over and everyone had to evacuate in the area. So my dad, my mom, and I went to stay a few days with my father's best friend, Steve. My uncle Steve, as I called him, just so happened to be an expert martial artist, and I was one of his students. I was very familiar with camping out at Steve's. I was about nine at the time and in our Cub Scouts and was very familiar with camping, fishing, and hunting. Steve lives in a double-wide trailer on Lake Timberline, Missouri. We spent many a weekend there camping, fishing, and hanging out with the family. Lake Timberline was pretty undeveloped back then. There were several lakes full of fish and a large population of white-tailed deer in the area, ripe for fishing and hunting. It was late day, a couple of hours before night when we arrived. There was a path out past the trailer, back off to the right, 100 yards or so, where you could drive a single truck or a couple four-wheelers down through the tree line to an area. We played horseshoes, and there were bales of hay stacked with targets for archery and gun practice, and then led further down a couple hundred yards to the lake where we fish. I had walked that path many times with my pop and Steve, and even by myself. I was raised with a fishing pole in my hands, and, like I said, was a Cub Scout and was no stranger to the woods. Anyway, we had just arrived a couple hours before dark, and we began to unpack and get situated. 
I remember I had my two favorite toys with me, a lion and a Mumra Thundercats. They both had light-up eyes. When you press this red battery pack to this hole in their back, when you did this, the eyes would glow bright red. My parents were busy trying to start a fire and making drinks, so I decided I'd go and play. I decided to go off down to where the backstop of one of the horseshoe pits over by the tree line by the hay bales were. It seemed like an epic spot for lion and Mumra to square off and do battle. So I'm sitting there playing with my toys, talking to myself and making their eyes glow when I hear a sound of leaves crunching like something's moving toward me from the wood line. It didn't sound like anything big, mind you, so it didn't freak me out or anything. I just remember hearing it walk up. I remember standing up and looking toward the sound and seeing what looked like a funny little dog face looking at me through the trees and brush. I remember being so excited because it looked like a young dog and I loved dogs and I wanted a doggy playmate. I took a knee and called to it to try to get it to come over and not spook it. It kind of just looked at me in shock like an excited dog, it made this high-pitched whine. I made Lion-O's, lies light up, Lion-O's eyes light up, and then it shook with excitement. Again, making those muted barks dogs do. I did it again and again, trying to coax the dog out from the brush. I remember it had, I had some jerky and some candy in my pocket from the long drive over. I took a tiny bite of my jerky and showed the dog and tossed it about three feet from me. That's when it, to my best of knowledge, hopped out and trotted towards me and gobbled down the jerky. It had large ears like a German Shepherd propped on the top of its head, fur coming off of the tips and the side of the ear. It had a thin black snout. The face was all black, and its ears and body were gray-colored, reminiscent to a raccoon. I was very confused at what I was seeing in front of me, but I want to say, at still this point, I'm not afraid of it. It was very puppy-looking, very inquisitive, and just seemed harmless. I thought it looked very strange, because as it sat back, now completely in the open, and its arms reached for me, it sat back on its hind legs in a weird way, like how a dog does when it sits on its hind legs and begs. It had its arms in front of it, just like begging dogs do. But the arms were long, and at the wrist and hands looked like little black raccoon hands. I reached out slowly with my hand, and it put its hand around the top of my hand and sniffed and licked my hand. I tried not to move too abruptly, half thinking that maybe this is a really big weird raccoon or something. It then put my hand in its mouth and was lightly biting on my hand like puppies do. It felt just like puppy teeth, very sharp and needle-like, but it didn't seem like it wanted to hurt me. So then I started to play with this animal for a good while till it started getting dark and I heard my dad whistle for me. My dad has this super loud whistle, and whenever I heard it, I knew to come a running. He used to say, if you can't hear my whistle, then you are too far. I remember when I heard the whistle that it spooked my new furry friend, and it got up and ran right back into the brush it originally came from. I tried to get it to come back out, calling to it, thinking, wow, maybe I can keep my new furry little friend. My dad whistled a second time and called my name. That's when I noticed, standing next to the tree and the brush my new friend was in, is what I describe at the time, Wiley Coyote standing there staring at me. My dad whistled and yelled again, and this thing just bent over and picked up my little friend and started walking off. This scared me unbelievably. It looked cartoonish and unreal. It looked like a thin coyote standing there with these long, thin arms hanging down in front and long, thin fingers. Its top canines protruded out of its closed mouth, and it had coloring of those like rusted colored Malamute, or I guess 
maybe lighter colored coyotes. It had this fluffy mane around its neck. Its ears had dark tufts of hair like a bobcat. It was very thin. It just looked at me, grabbed the little one, and walked off. I backed away slowly. My feet turned and ran. I met my dad halfway down the road, and he asked what I was doing, and I told him I was very excited and scared. I'm going over the events with my dad when he noticed I stunk like a skunk had sprayed me. He actually made me strip and hose off and immediately take a bath. They put my clothes in a plastic bag and kept it outside because it smelled so bad. I thought maybe the little guy peed on me when we were playing or something. Later on that night, I woke up to barking noises. I walked over to the bat bathroom next to the back door and looked out the screen door. That's when I saw the big one standing right outside the fog lights, right outside the light. It just stood there as we stared at each other. I went to wake up my mom and dad, but when my mom came to look, it was gone. That was my first encounter. There's more from the next couple of days that followed, and Will eventually went and stayed somewhere else for the rest of the flood. The following years, there were some other encounters as well. The following summer, actually. Tonight's final Missouri subscriber encounter. Actually, this is the final Missouri subscriber encounter. Hey, Jeff. Not really knowing where to place or how to categorize my experience, it is not a traditional dogman sighting. I feel compelled to write to you in hopes of understanding what I saw as a child growing up in the 80s in a small, unincorporated town of Missouri. My name is C, and over the last few months I've enjoyed listening to your stories of your audience guests and insights on your channel. Although I teeter with self-doubt, I feel that I have a shared camaraderie with many here. However, whenever I have had an unusual, unnerving happening, that old experience resurfaces in my mind, never really gone, like an echo. I grew up as a river kid. My family's home sat on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River, about 20 miles south of St. Louis. From the river, only the Burlington North Rail Line separated our property, which was about 10 acres of heavily forested mix of oak, cedar, hickory, and wild blackberry thickets that are all common in that area. North, about a half a mile, was a dense law of south of us, more forest, and the limestone caves of Sulphur Springs. I used to spend my summer days scouring the shores of the Mississippi, building forts in the woods with my brothers and the neighborhood kids, and walking the tracks idyllic in so many ways. We were what you'd call cash poor but spiritually rich. My granddad bought an abandoned house and property for pennies in the early 60s. He grew up in the neighborhood fascinated with the house and bought it as a way to start his life with my grandma. With soaring 12-foot ceilings and sweeping river views, he made it livable again with a whole lot of hard work. Even though the house was never fully restored, it was beautiful. It was a remnant of Victorian stateliness and originally built by a riverboat captain. The house also boasted two additional outbuildings, a barn and a servant's quarter. Both were razed to the ground when I was about 10 to protect my younger siblings as structures were far beyond repair and hazardous. My mom says she remembers her dad warning of hobos train hopping in the 60s looking for a dry place to sleep at night in the barn, which sat away from the main house about a hundred yards out of sight down the slope embankment. The house had its share of tragedies as well. Before having sat abandoned for many years, several of the first inhabitants, including children, had died from scarlet fever. The original family cemetery and headstones of the family remain though now on an adjoining lot that belongs to the neighbor, and so that is where my story begins, in this big old house on the river corridor. Some people speak the ley lines or the natural conductivity of water and certain minerals and stones that are common in the Mississippi River Valley as conduits of paranormal activity. This river that flows down through this country is the cornerstone of some of our oldest 
cities, St. Louis, Memphis, New Orleans, and thousands of years before that, Clovis civilization was found here. And the mound city of Chahoka, it truly has inspired story, culture, art, and fable from Hannibal down to the murky bayou backwaters of Louisiana. The house itself is special in more than one way. It seemed to be a beacon for the weird, total strangers. Psychics, the looky loos would find their way up the long private drive, stand agape outside of our gravel driveway and say they saw this house in their dream. We never let anyone tour our house as we feared of what they may bring with them. See, it was as if the house itself was sensitive, sensitive to strife, marriage discord, and arguing. For everyone that has lived in this house, all the paranormal experience to tell running the gambit from knocking on walls, footsteps from nowhere, shadows, shaking beds, objects suspended in air, power cycling of electronics, flickering lights, and creatures. My grandfather had restored the house and died in the year before I was born. As he was failing, my mom and dad moved back in with my grandmother to help her look after the old place. Enjoying being the only and eldest child for some time, I usually slept downstairs with my grandmother. Not all the rooms in the house were equipped with the oil heat registers, but the downstairs living room was. That's where we would often sleep. The living room had one of the best views of the river, overlooking Illinois side and adjacent to the double locking wooden doors that was actually the original entrance to the home. Grandma was a pie baker, and so had baker's hours. Even when she wasn't working, the living room had about a ten-foot hallway that separated it from the kitchen, where a pantry and water closet were. So sitting in either room, whether the kitchen or living room, a person would have a straight line of sight, if on the right side, to see into the other room. At the time, I was about four, maybe five, long before I knew being scared of anything was. I had no exposure to scary stories, movies, or paranormal ideas. It must have been about 4.30 in the morning before any daylight filtered through the windows. It was still pitch black outside and I could smell Grandma's routine, toast, molasses, and coffee. I woke up facing the hallway and could see clearly my mom and Grandma at the kitchen table speaking softly. Like a kid, I wanted to join them. I rolled over onto my back and let my eyes fall around the room with the light from the kitchen. In the corner of the room next to the window was a TV stand with an old box-style TV. Behind it, I saw something that did not belong. A large, dark figure lurked in the corner of the room behind the TV set. Even now, 30 years later, my eyes well up just writing the sentence. I was instantly paralyzed in fear. I pulled the covers over my face after I saw what looked like a big bad wolf peering at me. From behind the TV. Its shoulders, chest, and head easily cleared the television set and stand reaching a solid six to seven feet, tall pointed ears, snout, and glinty eyes on a dark shape made of shadow is all I could see in that dimly lit room. I meekly gathered my courage to call out to my mom to come and get me. Well, we ain't that type of family. No, she said. Mom, please. No, Chrissy. You come here. After lying as still as possible, I jumped out of bed and ran into the kitchen. I didn't want to go back into the living room until daybreak and unaccompanied. A strong-willed kid, I was determined not to be sent back, so I folded myself onto the Formica tiled floor, quiet, cold, and content. I did not know that experience would haunt me and whisper into my ear again and again in my life, no matter how far I tried to bury it into my mind, as wayward children imagination. It was not until years later that I told my parents the story. It's something I consider traumatizing and unable to shake. How could something like this be in my house? I shared the story with my two brothers as a teenager. What color eyes did it have? They asked me. I said red for lack of a better description. However, after listening to some experiences on your channel, I'd like to amend that and say they were the color of embers, that glowing of fire, that ember, 
orangey red heat. That's the color. I don't believe to have experienced a flesh and blood dog man, but some type of demonic paranormal entity. I believe that both exist, but not sure if they intersect. As I said, the house itself, or maybe it was the land or history or limestone, seemed to always be precipice. Also like a portal, almost like a portal. We never dabbled with the occult. It seemed strictly forbidden. The house was blessed a few times, and each time it felt like a weight was lifted, an oppressive feeling would leave, but would inevitably return with life's disappointments and upsets. In a most nagging way that my brain would not let me forget, I briefly only remember that early morning whenever I have an experience with something haunted, a strange sound, a cold chill, an unexplainable rustling, a tap or a knock out of place. I remember being a teenager approximately 10 years after seeing the thing and falling asleep with my family watching TV, only to wake up absolutely paralyzed and realize that I was downstairs in that room by myself. I've always felt especially sensitive to the paranormal and do not invite these curiosities into my life. Because as my dad always said, you go looking for the devil and you're going to find him. While the house was sold this year, my family still lives nearby in the area. I live in Washington State now. I never let this experience sully my time outdoors, as it is one of my few places I truly feel content. I have hiked hundreds of miles, loping through Mount Rainier, Wentichi, Mount Baker. I try to find time whenever I can to get away from my pharmacy career. My mom, a fan of the channel, has been paranoid for me for years living in Bigfoot country, but the natives here do not fear Bigfoot and know of him. That's good enough for me. To me, Dogman has always been some kind of paranormal thing, and I had no reason, especially given my early experience, to believe otherwise. I was always quite happy as a tomboy roaming around the river bottom, woods, and tracks without fear. It was only recently that I had my first ever chilling outdoor experience that gave me a pause. Pacific Northwest summers make the long, wet winters here worth it. During the pandemic, I put my gym membership on hold and decided to hike around the many small natural parks available in the Puget Sound for daily exercise. It was not in the big national forest that I felt afraid, but a relatively small power line trail park that I felt keenly alone, but not alone for the first time. This past June of 2020, I had done a semi-regular loop at the nearby city park. It had rained in the morning and the forecast called for more rain in the following day. Wanting to make the most of the day considering the forecast, I decided to explore a nearby power line trail that had always looked inviting. Being a woman alone has never bothered me. Sturdy, sure-footed, and generally confident, I don't think twice when I notice an offshoot from a main trail. Reason that I am in an urban environment with a four-lane road nearby. What's the worst that's going to happen? Secondary loop is longer than I anticipated, but having a day off from work, I invited the challenge. The whole area in which I enjoy hiking was part of an old mining operation. Miners tried digging coal out of various spots in the foothills during the western expansion wrapping up the last of the operations in the mid-1900s. A few caverns and air shafts are still visible, and the occasionally piece of coal can be found. It is quite beautiful what nature has reclaimed. A year-round creek zigzags its way through the land, providing the occasional water feature, entering off the side of a busy main road and nearby retention basin. I was caught off guard how quickly the trail descended. Headphones in, I trailed down the switchbacks, heading towards and flowing Rock Creek, surrounded by fern moss and the typical Pacific Northwest beauty. Having traveled about a quarter of a mile, I remarked to myself that already the sound of the busy four-lane road was gone. 
Noticing the quiet, I took my earbuds out and continued to walk along for a few more minutes. Before I reached the creek, I suddenly realized I was alone. I had an utter sense of vulnerability. I did not necessarily think any creature, but I felt like prey. I felt scared at this point. I didn't know if it would be faster for me to go back the way I came or to power through and head up the valley going the other side. I just knew that I wanted to get out of there and fast. I started to sweat and feel the adrenaline rush my body. I had an intense sensation of being watched. I decided to keep moving and not go back through the creek valley in case something or someone was watching me from there. I just could not shake that feeling that I was being stalked. Although it was not a hot out, I felt sweat on my back and chest as I listened for every sound in the forest that day. Not a single person around, totally uncharacteristic for the area. Finally, I began to make my way up the valley. I strained my ears, listening for any sound, hoping to hear birds. I reached the tree line, hoping to hear birds. I scrambled, panicked for the next 15 minutes, intense cardio, climbing, muddy trail, until I reached the tree line, where I heard crows calling again. With a ravine behind me, I knew when I heard the birds after so many minutes of silence, I was going to be okay. Much unlike popular depictions, I felt no more foreboding. Crows do not travel into deep woods, and so I knew a clearing was right ahead. To me, that meant safety. I have not been able to shake off that experience from the past summer or go back into the woods since. Something has changed. I stay on sidewalks, neighborhood streets, and wide-open public beaches since that day. My mom, on the other hand, is delighted. As my trips and hikes worried her a lot, I suppose I am looking for a way to reconcile these experiences and define them. I consider myself open-minded and do not think that every perceived paranormal experience is necessarily evil. I think there are so many things that exist in our universe that we just are not privy to yet or understand. I will continue to enjoy your stories on your channel and the sharing of the unusual and with mindfulness. All right, folks, what an awesome upload to start the day with. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd also like to thank you for supporting this channel. Your support is truly what makes this channel continue to grow and go and what makes it a place for people to want to share their experiences, ideas, and theories with zero ridicule, zero judgment, just simply treated with the respect that they deserve. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They're out there. They're dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.